Hey, Mr. Trigger here. Uh, today's vodcast, we're going to be talking about HIV, the testing and transmission. Uh, so basically what we're going to answer the question today is, is how do I get it? Uh, we're going to be able to answer that question um, uh, no matter what's thrown at us. Can I get HIV if I use a public toilet? Can I get HIV if I share water with somebody? Can I get HIV if I hug somebody? Um, all those questions we'll be able to answer. It's very simple because we're going to learn about what HIV basically is found in and then how it's transmitted and then also how we test for it. And, uh, and then the different uh, ca categories or classifications of HIV there are. All right. So let's start off with how do I get HIV? Well, very simply, we're going to look at the fluids that HIV are found in. It's a very specific uh, group of fluids. And uh, unless you come in contact with these fluids, you can't get it. All right. So the first fluid that we find is human blood, breast milk, vaginal secretions, and semen. Those are the only four fluids that HIV is active in where it can be actively transmitted from one person to another. Um, now, what you have to ask yourself is, if I come in contact with any of these four fluids, what's the chances that I can get HIV? And the chance would be high. If you come in contact with someone else's blood, someone else's vaginal secretion, someone else's breast milk, or someone else's semen, you run a high risk of catching HIV if they have the virus also. Right? If you don't come in contact with these fluids, you can't get it. It's that simple. And so if someone says, uh, well, can I get it from sharing a glass of water? HIV is not in water. It's not in saliva. And unless there's blood, vaginal secretions, breast milk, or semen on that glass, you're not going to get it. Um, I would suggest if it is on the glass, I wouldn't drink it. Um, so really, it, it's a very simple answer when someone asks the question, can I get HIV if? If you don't come in contact with any of these four fluids, the answer is no, you can't get it. If you do come in contact with these fluids, the answer is maybe. You still might be able to get it. But there's another little trick here with HIV is that you have to have a direct opening into your bloodstream in order to get uh, the virus that's in one of these pot uh, potential fluids. Um, which means if, if I help somebody, let's say they, they get in a fight and their nose is bleeding and, and they, they have uh, HIV and I help them and I get some of their blood on my hand. There's no, that's not a guarantee that I'm going to get it. If I have a cut on my hand, then it's a high probability I could get HIV. But I have to get a direct, some kind of direct contact of HIV right into my bloodstream. HIV is very weak outside the human body. Um, it, it, it can't survive in the atmosphere. Uh, so it has to be a direct uh, contact or direct passage from one person to another. That's very important to understand. So I, I can't uh, just spread it kind of, you know, however. It's got to be a direct contact from one person to another, and it's got to be from one of these four fluids. <clears throat> so what are some of the most common behaviors that HIV is transmitted in and has been transmitted through? Well, obviously sexual contact uh, because you're coming in contact with potential vaginal secretion, semen, that kind of stuff. That's a, a no-brainer. Um, IV drug use. And the issue with IV drug use is the sharing of needles. And it's not so much the blood that's on the outside of the needle. It's the blood that's on the inside of the needle, inside the syringe, that doesn't get exposed to the atmosphere but does uh, have uh, blood in it. Because when, when usually people use IV drugs, they, they draw blood into the syringe with the drug mixture and then they plunge the drug mixture into their system. And then if they pass it to somebody else and they use the same syringe, the same needle, then the blood can mix together inside the syringe. So it's not so much what's on the outside, but what's on the inside. Childbirth. Obvious reasons. Contact with vaginal secretions, contact with blood, uh, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, and this is typically how the baby gets HIV that's passed on from mother to child. And a lot of times it's through the eyeballs. Uh, when um, the baby goes through the birth canal and the baby's opening and closing its eyes during the process, and some of that infected fluid could get inside the baby's eyes and directly into their system. Um, unsterilized tattooing, again, that has to do with needles, and it's with the blood inside the, the uh, needles uh, themselves, so it's when people don't, don't sterilize or clean the, the needles that they're using. Typically, in most reputable tattoo shops, they're going to open the sterile needle, the sterile packaging, right in front of you, so you're going to see that it's a sterile needle that they're using to tattoo with. Um, unsterilized body piercings, again, it has to do with needles. Um, this one's a little bit less likely than tattooing because typically um, you're not using a needle that, that basically is hollow. Um, typically it's solid, um, but it is possible uh, in terms of blood or um, uh, blood traces inside of a needle. Injuries exposed to infected body fluids, and this is um, like people like healthcare workers might deal with, doctors, emergency room nurses, uh, people like that, um, even coaches, um, physical education teachers, um, you know, anyone that might be exposed to potentially infected body fluids like blood, 
like potentially uh, vaginal secretions. You're talking about uh, doctors and things like that. Um, <clears throat> blood rituals. This is where people used to um, uh, like prick their fingers and mush them together. They would they would cut their hand and they would shake hands and they would they would basically mix this blood together and symbolically it would represent we mix our blood together and so now we're blood brothers. Uh, nowadays, what they try to do for any of those kinds of rituals is to squeeze blood onto the floor, or onto the ground, and then you you mix it on the ground so you don't ever touch uh, uh, those those things together because that's a high risk for transmitting not only HIV but other types of bloodborne pathogens. Breastfeeding again, HIV stays active in breast milk; it can go right from mom into the baby system, and then through that, uh, the baby can get it. Um, and then lastly, any blood transfusions that happened before 1985, this is actually what created uh, the big spread of HIV throughout our country is because we didn't realize HIV was in blood. And so therefore we didn't test it in our blood supply because we didn't know it existed. And so that's how it kind of got all over the place and really kind of started this whole pandemic that we had uh, in the late 80s, early 90s of, of all these different people uh, popping up with HIV. Since 1985, we haven't had any transmission of HIV through the blood supply because it gets tested and retested so many times uh, before it actually gets put into somebody. So our blood supply is safe. We haven't had any transmission of HIV in the blood supply uh, since 1985, since we knew what we were looking for. So these are some of the most common behaviors uh, that people get HIV through. Uh, they're not the only ones, but usually the most common that, that people are aware of. <clears throat> now, how do we test for it? Okay, so if a person thinks that they have it, what do they do? Well, first of all, any health clinic is going to do it for free. Uh, you go to the Rock County Health Department here in, in our area or any, any county health department, and they're going to test for free. It's usually anonymous. You don't have to leave a name. You come back in for your results. There's, there's different ways that people do it, but it typically is anonymous. You go in and say you want an HIV test. You can test through your doctor. You can test in a hospital. There's all kinds of places you can get tests. Typically, the, the test that they're going to do is what's called an ELISA antibody test. And what the ELISA test is looking for is the antibodies that we release when HIV is in the system. It's much easier to find. Um, they're, they're more readily available in the blood in terms of, of a test picking up on that. Um, if we have the antibodies present, then HIV is there. Um, and so that's the most common test. It's very accurate and relatively inexpensive to use. There's another test called the Western Blot Test. And the Western Blot Test is a little bit more expensive. It is a little bit more accurate, and it's typically used if they have a, a strange or weird reading on an ELISA test. And then they might do a Western Blot, but typically the ELISA test is all they're going to use. Um, and then lastly, there's a home collection kit, and this is where you... Uh, basically do a test yourself. You um, you prick your finger, you put it on a collection pad, you mail that into a lab, the lab mails you back the results. And typically they're going to tell you either way you need to go see your doctor because there's a risk. If the test comes back negative, you obviously took an HIV test so you're worried they're going to say go see your doctor. If it comes back positive, they're going to tell you it tested positive, you need to go see your doctor. So a lot of times you just skip the middleman and just go to the doctor and get the test done. Uh, but that's another option that's out there, the home collection kits. So these are the three types of tests that, that are out there. The most common is the antibody test, looking for those antibodies um, for us to find out if we have HIV or not. And early detection is important because with medications and all that kind of stuff, um, we can really prolong, um, prolong our life and have a better quality of life, not to mention uh, knowing if we potentially can spread it to somebody else. That's probably the biggest deal. All right. Now, when you, when you get tested, a lot of times, depending on your situation, you're going to go through uh, what's called a six-by-six six window period, all right? Now, what that means is, is that they're going to ask you to come in and get retested uh, anywhere between six weeks to six months um, to see if the virus um, is really there or not. Now, this is typically true if you've engaged in any kind of high-risk behavior and your test comes back negative. So, you're at a... You're at a party, you're at a function, you, you uh, hooked up with this person, you had sex with them, you don't know their risk status, and now you're nervous that you might have gotten HIV. Let's say that happened two weeks ago, all right? You go in, you get a test, the test comes back negative, all right? What they're going to do is they're going to say, come back in six weeks to six months to get retested because you may have recently acquired the virus two weeks ago, which isn't going to give your body enough time to build up enough antibodies uh, to show up on a test and so what they're doing is is they're giving some time for your body to react to the virus if it's in your system and then that will show up on a test so then six weeks to six months later uh, when you come back provided you haven't engaged in any high-risk behavior during that window period and then you get a negative reading that's a true negative reading if it comes up positive 
What that meant is, is you had a false negative reading earlier, and it just meant you didn't have enough antibodies to pick up on the test. So the window period is pretty important. Now, if you go in and get tested just because you're freaked out, because let's say the kid you sit next to uh, in English class you think has HIV, um, if you didn't come in contact with any blood, vaginal secretions, breast milk, or semen, you're you're at low risk. You're at no risk for getting the, the, the virus. They're not going to make you come back and get retested. Uh, if you're adamant about getting tested, they'll test it. It'll come up negative. You didn't engage in any high-risk behavior. You're negative. They're not going to make you come back. This is really typical of someone who's engaged in high-risk behavior, and it, it comes up negative, um, and they want to they wanna just double-check and be sure. That's what the window period is about. <clears throat> Now, you take the test and, and you get a reading and <clears throat> you need to understand what the, the diagnosis or the titles are, all right? So first of all, HIV negative. This is what everybody wants to be, all right? HIV negative means that there were no HIV antibodies present in the blood. That means the HIV isn't in your system, all right? Um, that's what everybody wants to have. Now, let's say you do an illicit test and the test comes back positive. They did find the antibodies. Well, now we have to figure out are you HIV positive or do you have AIDS? All right. Now, HIV positive, the requirements for that is that the antibodies are present. Okay. That's obviously the, the first criteria. But then they're going to take a look at your um, T cell count. Now, remember in the vodcast yesterday, we talked about that CD4 cell, um, the, the condition or the health of your immune system. That's what they're going to look at. And uh, 200 is the magic number. All right. If your T cell count is a is 200 or higher, and you have the antibodies for HIV, then they're going to classify you as HIV positive. You can you can go a long time being HIV positive, 15, 20 years being HIV positive. Uh, you keep your your immune system strong. Um, you you eat well. You get rest. Uh, you you de-stress your life. You get on certain medications. You can go a long time being HIV positive. You still have the virus. You can still transmit it but at least your quality of life is going to be much greater than if you really didn't do anything or didn't know you had it. Now, let's say that you have the antibodies and your T-cell count is below 200. Then you would be diagnosed as having AIDS. Um, so that's the, the magic number is that 200. Now with AIDS also, um, if you have the, uh, the T-cell count below 200 or you have any specific opportunistic infections, remember we talked about those, like thrush, like the cytomegalovirus, like, you know, um, uh, the, the pneumonias, those kinds of things, they're also going to diagnose you with AIDS. What that means is, is that your immune system is weak enough uh, for those opportunistic infections to make you sick. Um, so then they're going to give you the diagnosis of AIDS. Typically, a diagnosis of AIDS means a shorter lifespan. Um, I've heard as, as early as two years, a diagnosis of AIDS usually gives you a two-year lifespan. Now, in today's day and age with, with technology and medications and things like that, that, that could be uh, different. And um, I do know of people who have been diagnosed with AIDS that have lived uh, uh, quite a long time uh, because of the medications and how they've taken care of their, cell, their, uh, their bodies and their health and all that kind of stuff. Um, but that's the difference because you'll hear people that are HIV positive and you'll hear people who have AIDS. And what does that mean? Basically, it's an it's a immune system status. Um, do they have a, a strong immune system or not? And that's really the difference between those diagnoses. Unfortunately, if you get diagnosed with AIDS, you start a new medication treatment or maybe you start a medication for the first time, your T cell count raises again above 200. You get rid of those opportunistic infections if you have them. They, they won't change your diagnosis because what, what it means is, is that your immune system has the potential to get that weak since it did it once before. So once you get that AIDS diagnosis, you're always going to have that. Um, and so that's what all these different, um, I guess, levels of the virus uh, uh, basically mean. Um, negative, no antibodies, you don't have the virus. HIV positive with a strong immune system. And AIDS means you've got the antibodies or you've got the virus in your system, but your immune system has the, uh, the potential to get, uh, to get really low and really weak. All right. Now, the AIDS iceberg here, this is just gives us an illustration of what we're looking at in terms of the population. So if you look at an iceberg, the most dangerous part of an iceberg is the part that you can't see. It's the part that's underneath the water. All right. So we're going to look at the tip of the iceberg, the, the, the part that we can see, the smallest part of the iceberg. And these are the people that have AIDS. Um, they, they know that they have it. There might be some noticeable things about them. They may have certain infections. They may have missed a lot of work. They may be on a lot of medications. There's things about them that you will notice that there's something different about them. 
That's the smallest population. That's the smallest group of people that we see with the virus. Then right under the surface of the water, as the, as the iceberg kind of gets bigger as, as it's in the water, these are the people who are HIV positive. They know they have the virus. They've been tested, uh, but they've, been, they've caught the virus early enough where their immune systems are still pretty strong. Um, they're, they're healthy. They look normal. They, um, they may or may not be on medications or a lot of medications, but they know they've got it. The most dangerous population uh, when it comes to HIV are the people that are below, uh, deep in the, into the, the iceberg, all right? And these are the people who have the virus and they have no idea they have it. And these are going to be people who don't think that it will happen to them because they live in the suburbs or because they're wealthy or because uh, they only have sex with attractive people or they're not gay or whatever the myths are that are out there. Um, they think that they're immune to it. They can't get it. AIDS doesn't happen to people like me. It, it doesn't happen in my community. And these are the, the, the people that, that really um, create the biggest problems because they don't know they have it. They don't get tested, and they wind up spreading it and giving it to other people. Um, and so this is the, the population that we really need to be worried about or the population that needs to be worried. Um, and so here I got a picture of a person who this would be an advanced AIDS case, what we would call full-blown AIDS. Now we can see he's in a wheelchair. He's in a hospital setting. We see these purple splotches all over him. That's called Kaposi sarcoma. It's a very common opportunistic infection uh, for people who have uh, advanced AIDS. He's very thin. If you look at his face, you can see his cheeks are sunk in. He's very thin. Um, uh, he probably has uh, wasting syndrome. Um, he probably has trouble keeping weight on. Um, maybe he's got digestive issues, you know, things like that. So this is going to be someone obvious that, that's, got, that's got AIDS or has a problem that we can see. The problem is, is that someone who's HIV positive looks just like you and me. Uh, they, have, they don't look any different than you or I, and we have no way of telling what they have unless we actually do a blood test on them. And that's what makes this HIV thing so scary. Now, in the United States, we kind of have it under control uh, to a degree. And I'm not saying lightheartedly that um, we don't need to worry about it anymore because we do, but we're not seeing this... Um, a big scary trend like we saw in the early 90s, uh, early to mid 90s, where I mean it was popping up all over the place and everybody was freaking out. Uh, we sort of understand it a lot better. We've got medications and our, our culture has been ingrained with AIDS and AIDS education. Um, it's not the big scary word that it used to be in the 90s. Um, but it is important that we understand what it is that we're dealing with because this is a virus. Once you have it, you'll have it for the rest of your life and you will eventually die from complications of it. That's just the fact of, of how this virus, this particular virus works until we find a cure for it. How to avoid infection? Uh, real simple, avoid high-risk behaviors. Okay? Anything that comes in contact with those four body fluids is going to be considered high risk. Okay? Second of all, abstaining from sexual contact, especially with people that you don't know their risk status. Um, uh, it doesn't even have to be sexual intercourse. There's other types of sexual contact where you can come in contact with sexual fluids and spread the disease. Um, and then lastly, condom sense, meaning that condoms are going to help reduce the risk of getting HIV, but they're not going to necessarily eliminate the risk. And that's some, something that's important for you to understand that even, even low risk means some risk. And you have to pay attention to that, that there is the possibility that you could spread the virus even though you're using uh, condoms. But definitely condoms are going to help reduce the risk uh, much better than uh, any other form of birth control that's out there. Uh, just because you are basically protecting yourself from the body fluids of another person. All right? So... Understand uh, how you can and can't get it, how we test for it, and then what those different classifications mean. That's all I got for HIV. I uh, hope you grab a couple uh, nuggets of wisdom here and uh, make sure that you uh, don't do anything stupid. Keep your pants on. It's always a safe bet.